Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Jayanth Menon, and I'm a senior fellow at the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. I want to start by thanking the Heinrich Foundation and the Asian Trade Center for asking me to moderate this webinar, this webinar today on competition in the digital age. As I'm sure we all know, uh, the digital economy has led to explosive growth for global tech firms. But the success of select companies has prompted greater scrutiny of tech giants and existing competition policy. Can regulation reassert the importance of ensuring healthy competition? Uh, do policy responses address the consumer welfare principle? Are small businesses or MSMEs really the biggest beneficiaries of competition policy? Or could regulation designed to level the playing field end up impairing the development of MSMEs. We are here today to try and answer these and other related questions. And we hope many of those questions will come from all of you. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Q&A function on your screen. Uh, you can start typing in your questions at the, as they come to mind at any point. Um, we would just ask that you identify yourself and your affiliation and kindly keep your questions brief and succinct. Uh, please note uh, that this session is being recorded and that the recording will be available on the Heinrich Foundation website next week. Now we have a lot to cover in less than an hour, so let's get started. We have a great set of speakers today. Uh, I will only briefly introduce them because of time, but their full bios are on the Heinrich website. Our first speaker, which I'm sure is well known to all of you, is Deborah Elms. Uh, Debbie is the founder, founder and executive director of the Asian Trade Center. She is also vice chair of the Asia Business Trade Association and a senior fellow in the Singapore Ministry of Trade and Industries Trade Academy. Debbie, uh, let's start with your presentation. You have 10 minutes, over to you. Fantastic, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and I'm very happy to be joined by my fellow panelists on this important discussion. And I'm very happy to see so many uh, old friends in particular coming uh, to see this webinar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly share my screen, which hopefully goes as quickly as you one always hopes. Excellent. Give it a second. Okay, so you can see this now, yes? Fantastic. Okay. All right. This is a, a presentation, and I'll make it as short as possible, based on a paper that we prepared uh, for the Hendrick Foundation. We've been working on a series of five papers with the Hendrick Foundation that are focused on new issues and new challenges in digital trade in particular. So the first paper came out at the end of last year, highlighted some of the key issues uh, that are unresolved that need to be addressed on digital trade. And then we've had a series of papers since then. This is the fourth one in the series on competition. The fifth one in the series is actually up on the Hendrick Foundation website about the importance of digital trade for economic development. And uh, I encourage you to look at, at that paper as well. We'll be having a webinar uh, shortly on that paper uh, to finish up the series. This paper that I'm gonna talk about today is available also on the Hendrick Foundation website, as well as on our website. At the end of my presentation is a QR code for you to get access to that paper. And I just wanna note before I go any further, uh, the importance uh, of one of the authors on this paper, Nick Agnew, who works at the Asian Trade Center, who worked at the Asian Trade Center uh, in producing this particular paper. So with that, let me go ahead and get, get straight into this. 
What I'd like to do is give you an overview of the, some of the topics that we raised in the paper and then have a dialogue with my panelists and get questions from the audience about how do we deal with some of the competitiveness challenges that are attached to the digital economy. As you all know, digital trade has exploded in growth and in particular, it has exploded in growth in Asia. Uh, and I think that that's all to be welcomed. And many of us, again, all of us on Zoom and many of us in our personal lives are experiencing some tremendous opportunities that come from having increasing digital trade. We're also all beneficiaries, I'm certain, of digital platforms that range from you know, a Zoom trade platform to you know, I came back from lunch today in a grab car in Singapore to all kinds of other digital platforms and applications that can help reduce friction, uh, market failures and trade distortions. But the rise of many of these extremely powerful tech platforms in particular has given rise to concerns about the concentration of market dominance in the hands of certain kinds of firms. And in particular has led to a corresponding rise in uh, concerns by government officials about whether or not that competition is healthy, whether that competition fosters growth and economic development, especially among smaller firms, and then what is it that government can do to rein in the power of, potentially rein in the power of some of these tech giants. Many officials increasingly argue that if you used antitrust or competition policy rules, you could level the playing field. But as Jay noted earlier, one of the big challenges that we flag in this paper is that if you get it wrong, ironically enough, you could actually damage the prospects, especially for the smaller firms uh, who have no ability to handle complicated uh, policy landscapes and who rely on certain kinds of tech platforms, large and small, uh, to increasingly deliver the goods and services that they produce to their customers. Not all MSMEs, let me just be clear, are business to consumer MSMEs. Many of them are business to business, but they also find their trade is often facilitated or mediated on different kinds of platforms. And again, platforms can be all kinds of, of different kinds of platforms uh, in different spaces. Those digital platforms, and the paper goes into certain uh, categories of digital platforms, everything from marketplaces to social networking to search engines and so forth, have particular characteristics that make them challenging for competition authorities. And one of them is that they have indirect and direct network effects. The more users you have on a platform, the more valuable the platform becomes, the more valuable the platform becomes, the more you get businesses that want to be on that platform and the more attractive it is ultimately for users of that platform. So we have a, a sort of you know, cycle that forms. Uh, and one of the challenges that we often find, at least that I often find when dealing with government officials is this idea that in order to reduce market dominance of some platforms, we should make a new platform. And if we made a new platform, then we would have businesses that would be much more competitive in that space. And the challenge with that, uh, there are many, and I'm sure that this will come up in the conversation uh, that follows. But one of the challenges with that is that it's very hard to get people to use a brand new platform unless there's some compelling reason for them to do so. And particularly for smaller businesses, if you move smaller businesses onto unknown and unfamiliar platforms, you may have actually condemned them to purgatory because nobody will find their goods or services on unknown platforms. And so this is a bit of a challenge that has to be addressed. And in particular, we find often first mover effects in the digital space so that we have sort of natural monopolies that form. And then we have other challenges along the way, which again, we will, we will discuss in the Q&A. In competitive marketplaces, businesses are often incentivized to offer high quality goods and services at lower prices than their competitors in order for them to capture the larger share of the consumer marketplace, right? So obviously competition matters tremendously in a digital world and also of course in a non-digital world. One of the issues that we have is that the tools that have been developed to handle monopolies or anti-competitive behaviors are often driven, especially in the digital space, by 
country's ability to manage these kinds of platforms, given their levels of economic development, the ideological perspective that they may bring to this, and the capacities that they may or may not have to enforce uh, antitrust or anti-competitive behaviors. So we see in this paper, and again, we're not solving the problem, we're really flagging it, but we're suggesting that in this paper that traditional discussions about markets may or may not fit very well with the rise of online marketplaces, online social networking, online, online tools, and other kinds of applications. And that is creating real challenges for governments. It's creating challenges for companies as well, especially because we have overlap with new areas, including intellectual property rights, data privacy, investment laws, and so forth. I'm not gonna go into that now, I'm just gonna flag them here and happy to discuss them later. In the Asia Pacific, we have varying levels of capacity to be able to enforce um, anti-monopoly, antitrust, or, or competitive, anti-competitive behavior in the region because we have different, obviously, levels of economic development. The market structure is quite different across many of these economies. ASEAN in particular has, or Asia and ASEAN both, have unusual types of applications. They're either called multi-service apps or they are super apps. And these super apps are a real challenge often for com competition authorities because they aggregate different kinds of services. So they could be messaging plus commerce plus payments plus ride sharing. So those of you who are in ASEAN will be familiar with GoTo or Grab. Uh, those folks based in China, of course, very familiar with the dominance of Alibaba and its network and so forth. And this has created some different kinds of competitive challenges that authorities are now grappling with across this region, even when they have, as I noted at the beginning, inconsistent ability to do so uh, in terms of looking at this problem and then potentially solving whatever challenges they see arising from competition um, that is leading to new challenges. I won't go into this, but I just wanted to say that the paper goes through a number of the countries in the region just to highlight their ability, the kinds of tools that they have available and the ways in which they are using competition law or competition policies to regulate the digital space. But one of the things that we think is important for digital competition and in general is to think about why do we want to limit competition in the first place? And the key reason is that you want to make sure that the, a monopoly does not harm consumer welfare. Okay, and so that's the sort of overarching goal typically of competition policy, but it can be really challenging to apply to the digital space because the digital space doesn't necessarily align with the offline world. And in particular, one of the big challenges the competition authorities have is that many of the services that are provided in the online space are free. And traditional uh, competition policy levers rely on prices as one of the mechanisms to use to determine whether or not a monopoly has too much power uh, and then how you would appropriately regulate those monopolies. And when the situation is free, it becomes really challenging. So unpriced platforms have made it particularly challenging for competition authorities to handle the, this new regulatory landscape. What we're suggesting in the paper, as with most of the things actually that we've been doing in the digital space in the Hendrick Foundation series is to say, that you need to be very careful if you're a government regulator to think hard about different stakeholders and in particular to be thinking about what consumers need to make sure that that consumer welfare principle is upheld, but also, and I think this is crucial, what smaller businesses need because the, the ability of smaller businesses to use online platforms has been a gift for many MSMEs who have now discovered new markets, new opportunities, new customers in places often across borders that they never anticipated having uh, access to before. So we need to be very careful as we regulate to make sure that consumers are not harmed, actually harmed by co competition rules that are designed to, to facilitate uh, consumer welfare, but also that small businesses continue to thrive in this space. <clears throat> 
And this is the QR code for the paper that we are discussing. And again, you'll, you'll have access to these slides and to the video at the end. So you can go back and look at this. I encourage you to, if you would please, download the paper, read it, and, and give us your comments and your feedback for that. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and stop and say thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here with you. And I'm really looking forward to a lively discussion with the rest of my panel. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. And thank you for keeping to time. Uh, I think uh, you've given us a lot, of, uh, a lot of things to think about. I'm not going to try and summarize uh, everything you've said right now, but I think um, you've obviously raised the, a number of interesting trade-offs that we have to consider, um, perhaps striking this balance uh, between ensuring uh, competitive practices that limits the market power of first movers, while still enabling firms to innovate and achieve those scale economies uh, that we know are important for consumer welfare through efficiencies. Now, this is difficult for any industry, but you've uh, highlighted a few interesting features of this digital arena, uh, including you know, uh, free services, which takes away that price uh, mechanism uh, as a way of monitoring uh, market power, um, but also the pace of technological change, which is the most rapid, I guess, of almost any industry. And regulators might find themselves uh, in a position where they are almost always playing catch up. Um, so I think um, how we square that circle is something that we will need to keep coming back to. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, so lots to think about. And um, now before I introduce our next speaker, let me remind everyone again that the Q&A box is there for you to ask your questions. Please, uh, please type in your questions as they come to mind. And uh, now our first uh, discussant uh, of two uh, is uh, Dionysus Kolokotsis, uh, who will provide a view from the private sector an insider's view, if you like, um, as he leads uh, Google's economic and competition policy strategy in the Asia Pacific region. So we're very pleased to have that perspective with us uh, here today. And prior to this, uh, Dionysus was the global communications manager at Procter and Gamble. And before that, uh, general manager of the Group Semiconductor Industry Association. So Dionysus, uh, you have eight minutes, please. Thank you, Jay, and uh, uh, hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank um, Debbie, uh, first of all, for framing this debate uh, in an uh, extremely welcoming and inspiring way. So I look forward for, to our discussion. Um, I would also like to thank the Asia Trade Center and the Henrik Foundation for organizing this discussion and for inviting me among such distinguished speakers and panelists. The topic is really timely and relevant with governments in Asia Pacific and around the world looking to introduce new digital policies. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Jay. You were talking about my background, both in the digital world and the consumer goods. So in these 20 plus years of, uh, of my journey, um, split between the consumer goods and the digital world, I'm fascinated by how technology drives innovation that improves uh, people's lives. In fact, smartphones are probably the biggest revolution of our times. They have made it possible for people to access innovation and express their views. Uh, Debbie was giving some great examples earlier to call a taxi or order a pizza and track the order real time. Smartphones have also made it possible for people to, of all ages to acquire new skills or even to earn a university degree. And even more important for businesses of all size to reach out to customers and to suppliers from all over the world. So it's not a surprise that I'm super excited with what digital technologies will bring next. As the smaller and larger companies will continue to innovate and compete in order to win more customers. These innovations do not come free of issues. As a government affairs professional, I'm, I'm keen to work with governments and policymakers more broadly 
to help address those challenges. Challenges that appear each time a new product is introduced or also when the conditions in the markets, in our societies change. So a key question I believe related to this complex matter that we are debating today is what are the key characteristics of a balanced digital policy framework to enable innovation and competition among businesses, but most of all, to benefit consumers. In the consumer goods industry, we used to say consumer is boss, but this is true for the digital world too. Innovation comes from companies which aim to solve real consumer problems and improve their lives. It's very clear, I believe, we're all consumers. It's very clear what we really benefit from. We benefit when we can have choice among innovative products that come at lower prices and at higher quality. And in fact, this is exactly what healthy competition should deliver. In the digital world, there is, intent comp there is an intense competition across ecosystems involving small players, larger companies, local or global companies for the benefit of the economy and of the consumers. Let's look in our region, in Asia Pacific. There are some very strong local players. Take the example of Naver in Korea, which is also frequently referred to as the Google of South Korea. Take companies which did not exist just a few years ago, and they became big market players within a very short time. Grab, Gojek, the jewels of Southeast Asia, Klug, Traveloka in the travel industry, Viber, fintech companies. I think APAC has become the cradle of fintech innovation. Um, actually, APAC is home to more than one third of the world's unicorns. But also let's think of more tangible oriented industries, device manufacturers. Who knew of Realme and OnePlus 10 years ago? And now these companies are competed head to, competing head to head with Samsung, Apple, and others. This innovation and fierce competition brings a lot of benefits to consumers. First of all, a vast array of apps, most of which actually more than 96% of them are free. Also lots of innovative services. I, I won't hide my favorite service, Google Maps. You can find where you are exactly, where you can go to very easily with public transport, but also nearby businesses, restaurants. As a driver, you can avoid traffic jams. You can save time, you can save fuel. You can do good for your pocket and for the environment too. But there are lots of benefits for ecosystem market players. Again, let me take Android um, as an example. Android is obviously the um, operating system for um, Google smartphones, uh, which is based on an ecosystem, which actually has an ecosystem, a balanced ecosystem of about 24,000 devices involving more than 500 operators around the world. This ecosystem enables millions, probably around 7 million app developers to access 190 markets, uh, I would say, uh, secure, risk free, not risk free, but securely and in a very easy manner. They, those companies, those developers need to focus on what they're good at developing um, consumer friendly and innovative apps. But as I mentioned earlier, innovation comes with challenges. We do understand those challenges and we are committed to work closely with policymakers to provide our expertise and help them take informed decisions. So Google supports governments to improve transparency within the digital ecosystem, including SMEs and larger companies. We see policy initiatives in Asia Pacific, which are heading the direction of a balanced approach to foster innovation, enable competition, and create more choices for consumers. For example, we support Japan's co-regulation approach in which the government and digital platforms collaborate closely to develop the next platform to business regulation with a very balanced mindset. 
We look forward to continue working with authorities in Japan in assessing the need and designing regulations as necessary. We also see how competition regulators often have to referee business disputes. Businesses competing in the same market or sector, they file competition complaints to extract better commercial terms or more favorable treatment. This is not new. This is a fact of business life. But what does all this mean for policymakers? We believe that regulating in a globalized digital economy calls for a balanced approach and a wide stakeholder dialogue with an international mindset. The ultimate objective is to promote competition and innovation for the benefit of consumer. Therefore, introducing new regulation needs to take into account the wider potential implications for businesses and for consumers, given the dynamic nature of digital markets. We urge policymakers to embrace an international mindset in developing policy that affects the digital economy. To learn from other successes and failures and listen to arguments from a range of stakeholders in other markets. Local solutions will unlikely work in a truly global digital economy. At the same time, a copy paste approach of regulations developed in another region, in another market, will unlikely serve the objectives of one particular market. Therefore, we encourage governments to carefully consider all aspects of policy issues and ensure that any policy intervention is justified by clear benefits to minimize the risk of unintended consequences for businesses and consumers. I'll pause here and hopefully later on, I'll have the opportunity to share with you a set of principles that policymakers may consider if they wish to introduce new competition policy frameworks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dionysus. Uh, I think uh, you started off by highlighting a lot of those uh, balancing acts that we have to engage in, which Debbie raised uh, in her presentation. And I guess uh, from a private sector point of view, it's not altogether surprising that you don't feel there's a big role to increase uh, regulation and there's enough of a self-regulating uh, mechanism operating in the background uh, that allows, um, you know, uh, that those balances to be struck. Um, and as someone who has no sense of direction, I think what you said about Google Maps is certainly agreeable. I think it's a great uh, service. Um, a question of whether it's completely free, of course, is something we can also discuss. Uh, of course, um, companies do collect a lot of data when we use uh, these free services and how that data is collected, used, and uh, so on might be an issue that we can come back to a bit later on. But thank you so much. Um, and I think I called you a discussant. I guess uh, I meant panelists, really, here talking, uh, having a conversation. And so um, although we are, we are discussing the uh, ATC's paper that they'll be presented, but going further than that. Uh, so let me now turn to um, our third and final panelist, um, Mr. Hosuk Lee Makiyama, uh, who's well-versed in EU competition policy, but uh, much more than that, uh, he's the director of the European Center for International Political Economy, ESA, and a fellow at the London School of Economics. Uh, previously, Hosuk was senior advisor at Sweden's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So Hosuk, uh, you have eight minutes as well, please. Over to you. Thank you, Jaya. It's great to see so many friends uh, in the panel, uh, as well as in the audience. And I try to bring my two cents uh, to Eurocent uh, to this conversation, uh, partly building on my experience uh, from Europe, but also from a bigger perspective of international competition law and why applying competition law is extremely difficult on network technologies compared to, let's say, petrol stations or airlines or whatever we are looking at from the traditional economy. And as exactly as both previous speakers have pointed out, the policy objective of competition policy or antitrust is not to protect competitors. It's not to protect companies. It's actually to protect consumers. That's paramount. 
And if you look at some of the cases we have seen in the hindsight, uh, because we have lived now with network technology for good 30 years, and we have had anti-competition, uh, uh, sorry, antitrust uh, enforcement beginning from the 90s, and we can actually look at how they have actually turned out. And especially if I look at cases like Microsoft that was forbidden to bundle Microsoft Windows Media Player uh, with their operating system, we can clearly see that they haven't actually necessarily turned out the way that we thought, proving their competition policy is really, really hard. If I look at the successful of the iPod, if anyone remembers still the iPod, or not to mention um, the, the company that dethroned Apple from the music scene, which is Spotify. Uh, actually, the, the competition market um, interventions that were done by the competition authorities had nothing to do with the success of the need of the iPod or the, uh, the Spotify uh, platform. So in other words, we can think, or we would like to think that the regulators want to do right but they don't actually at that point know what's going to be right, where the competition is going to come from in the future. And then when they actually enforce their rules and uh, their rulings, it could very well turn out for the negative. And as we said, um, the, uh, the most of the rulings that we have seen in the tech space had nothing to do with the fact, uh, had not, no positive impact on the future competition that followed. But having said that, I think that the, the global experience is that there can be gatekeepers of the ecosystems. And the ecosystems are quite different from how competition policies are used to tackling market concentration because platforms scale demand rather than supply. A shoemaker becomes a large shoemaker by producing as much as possible, exporting the surplus and trying to dominate the market and the pricing mechanism functions. And uh, what a platform does is not actually scale supply, but to scale demand. And very few players, even in the areas of telecoms or media in these advanced services, actually figure out in the 19s and the notes that that's where the competition is going to be uh, determined. And, uh, but one thing that we can see now for the past 10 years is that not all platforms are equal. Not all of them have market powers. And we can really clearly see that looking at not just the digital market, but also for the other markets that intermediaries or the brokers do not necessarily have to be the most powerful party in the relationship. And this is particularly true in the case of e-commerce. You have a lot of niche e-commerce players who have not necessarily the, the biggest um, power uh, in determining the uh, the price or the market relationship where the buyers or the sellers have the biggest power in actually. So in other words, uh, we can't assume that all platforms are gatekeepers, but even if we are, and um, not all of them have to be dominant, and, and even if they are actually dominant, that does not necessarily have to be an issue. Dominance, large companies, for example, in the, the, the brick and mortar world, like supermarkets, are clearly dominant. In most countries that we travel to in ASEAN have one or two or three major retail uh, vendors who dominate the retail space, at least in the urban areas. And that is not necessarily an issue unless they abuse that dominance. That's where it comes in. So we focus a lot on market concentration. And it is true that we have platforms that have 90% of them, the market. And, and that is not necessarily a problem as long as there is no problem getting into the market or leaving the market. And as I explained in the examples of Microsoft, we don't know where the competition is gonna come from. But one thing we know for a fact is that no dominance, not even Microsoft, not Google, not Amazon or no company is going to last forever. And this is the dynamic nature of competition. And, uh, but for the sake of the argument, and not just for the sake of the argument, uh, if you look at the clear history of the past, we can also see that there are examples of dominance that has been abused and where market failure has been established and clearly identified 
investigated, and we have actually seen that there is real consumer harm. And in those occasions, enforcement tends to be what I would call ex post, meaning that market failures has actually happened. An innovation has been established, it has been disseminated, user has congregated, and it has created a dominance for the platform, which has actually clearly been abused. And on those occasions, you can actually intervene and the competition policy has the power to investigate and establish it. And it also has the burden of proof, which means that all the three elements, meaning dominance, abuse, and harm has to be uh, established and according to the rule of law before it is remedied. And now I'm gonna be honest, it has been extremely difficult, especially in Europe to establish not even abuse or harm, but even dominance. The truth of the matter is very few platforms are actually dominant. If I look at, for example, just to take an uh, example of Amazon, it is the leading e-retailer, yes. That is absolutely true. But the fact that the majority of the purchases that you do on an Amazon platform, you do from offline or more likely through a more specialized platform. So if you actually calculate the market share of Amazon properly, it accounts for, let's say, less than 5% of a consumer's wallet. Whereas most items that you tend to buy through Amazon is more likely to be sold in a supermarket that has 40, 50% of the consumer's wallet. Similarly, if you look at search marketing, you can say that um, it's account well, of course, you know, uh, uh, if you're a biggest search engine, you're going to hold a large share of the, mar uh, the search uh, marketing market share. But if you look at the online advertising market uh, spectrum, search engine actually accounts for very little of it. Traditional media still controls quite a lot of the electronic marketing space. So this has led to uh, some creative solutions in ex post uh, addressing of the market failure. So for example, in the EU, in order to go after Android, we had to establish that Android had 100% of the Android market. Of course, Android has 100% of the Android market. And in the same way that Jose Klee Makiama has 100% of the Jose Kli Makiyama speaking pundit market. I'm a global dominant in that space. And I'm open for competition, by the way, uh, if anybody wants to actually enter the market, I would advise clearly against it. But these are clearly not the kind of tricks that you want to play in the name of rule of law. So this basically has led to a conclusion that antitrust is a dynamic field of law. It requires a unique understanding of markets, law and economics, which is if you combine markets, law and economics in a sentence, you know that very few people are going to actually possess both halves of the brain. It's extremely hard. It's also built on case law and which is arguably extremely difficult in Asia. And uh, even in countries like Japan and Korea on mainland China, actually antitrust is a relatively new discipline and you need a number of decades before you have established, let's say, a catalog or principle that can be drawn out of these cases, that can be applied in a flexible and in a workable manner. And it requires analysis situation from case to case, which allows us that you look at the dynamic nature of the competition that the platforms play. There are thoughts in the competition policy around what we call dynamic competition, which is not necessarily the competition of many, many players, but uh, where a company holds uh, the market for, let's say, two, three, five years, but where they can be challenged at any time. It's extremely easy, easy to enter, and it's extremely easy to leave, and nobody's there forever. And if you don't really believe me that they will not be there forever, I have a Microsoft Zoom media player that I would like to sell to you. Uh, so don't assume that just because you're big on the desktop, you're going to be big as a music player or you're going to be big on the cloud space or whatever we are looking at. So this change towards 
ex ante laws, so product laws, regulatory approaches to competition. This is actually, I would even go as far as saying that what we're seeing now in Europe and Japan and Korea is not even competition. You're basically giving up on antitrust enforcement because it's so hard to apply. And you're designing specific laws that are only applying to companies that rhymes with noodle or are named after major South American rivers and who are by default somewhat discriminatory because you are basically creating a set of obligations because you can't really prove they have failed the market. And that's a very dangerous approach to go. And as we heard from previous speakers, they create a lot of externalities in forms of, yes, if you enforce them to companies who rhymes with noodle, you have to apply to a range of other companies who are much smaller than they are, or you have to openly discriminate so that it doesn't actually apply to the companies who are much smaller than they are. And most of all, you are actually inf infringing on the consumer's right to choose and you are preventing innovation in a number of areas to force interoperability and access to supplementary functions and payment services, etc. There are a number of reasons why my FaceTime messages don't go through WhatsApp. End-to-end -end encryption is a very good reason. And uh, the fact that maybe that I, as a user of one platform, don't want to be compatible with another. I'll end here, but there are a lot of issues that are being raised by abandoning the ex post approach, addressing only failures and to a an ap regulatory approach where we create laws that assume that all platforms are going to be failures. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Hosuk. I uh, think you've uh, traversed a lot of terrain there and I was struggling to keep up with some of uh, the many interesting points you were raising. But I think uh, uh, what, one of the things that you said reminded me of how it's not just firms um, that can exploit their market power, but also, uh, you know, there's room to exploit, uh, you know, safeguards that are available and uh, that can be also used to impair competition. And um, I, I'm a trade economist, so I often think about parallels there and anti-dumping cases are often raised as an example of that type of phenomenon where, you know, just raising the anti-dumping case, irrespective of its, you know, validity, uh, you know, can in itself achieve the desired outcome, even if you end up losing the case by the time everything's sorted out and you have to prove, you know, material harm and so on and so forth. So this is the horrible mix of economics and lawyers coming into play, I guess, at one level. But um, okay, so uh, very interesting. And um, again, let me remind everyone, uh, please uh, use the Q&A uh, function to uh, post your questions and I'll be happy to take them. I've noticed they're coming in, uh, but let me get the ball rolling, if I may, and ask the first question. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, after Debbie's presentation, this idea of trade-offs again that I want to return to, uh, striking the balance between ensuring competitive practices that benefits consumers while still enabling firms to innovate and achieve scale economies that create efficiencies is a very difficult task. Anyway. But in this industry or sector uh, where the pace of technological change is so rapid, uh, regulators are often left always playing catch up. So um, if this didn't make things difficult enough, I think we must add a real world phenomenon into this mix, the very real possibility of regulatory capture, uh, which can corrupt the whole process. So it's hard enough, if you like, uh, when regulators have the best intentions, but unfortunately that's not always the case the risk of regulatory capture is increased when governance is weak and or there is a strong presence of government in business. Reflected, for instance, by the influence of SOEs or GLCs in the economy, uh, GLCs being government linked corporations. And this is the case throughout this region, from even Singapore and Malaysia 
all the way to Vietnam and China and almost every country in between. So uh, my question to any or all of you is how do we deal with the real possibility of regulatory capture in this framework? Or is it the straw that makes it all just a bit too difficult with less intervention being the least distorting option, including for SMEs in a second best world? Could we be better off relying on just existing laws on competition, the table that Debbie put up, plus self-regulating mechanisms that we've heard about in this environment? So, uh, sorry, uh, I did say we should keep our questions short, but I didn't follow my own rule there. But um, how do you think regulatory capture comes into play and does it actually reduce the need to try and do too much regulation? Um, Debbie, can I ask you to jump in first on this? Because I think you raised some of these issues in your presentation. Sure, I mean, I think this is a challenging one. And there's always the risk of regulatory capture in, in lots of government policy. I think it's a little less in some ways in the digital space because it's new, and uh, relatively new, because we have less regulation, less regulate, fewer regulators in many of these spaces. And so perhaps the risk is of regulatory capture might be less. I would say the risk for me, the risk is the opposite in this space, which is, we, the, to the extent that we have regulators, many of them are clueless, to be honest, because they're trying to regulate really fast moving, fast evolving spaces and their knowledge in order to do it well, as I think, especially Hosek's comments suggested, in order to do this well, you have to understand policy, law, economics, and crucially in this space, digital and technology, sort of that whole nexus of information. And that is very hard for a regulator to, to get their heads around and to be able to effectively and efficiently figure out what the regulation should be. And even when they do so, they have to think about not just today, but what will this mean for tomorrow? I don't think, let me just say one thing that, that occurred to me after I spoke that I should have highlighted. I don't think we're suggesting that there should never be regulations. I don't think that's the right policy either. It's not that you shouldn't regulate ever or that businesses prefer no regulation. Businesses are generally fine with regulation as long as it's clear, there's sort of guardrails in place because no regulations is the wild west and you never know when that might change. And suddenly a business plan that you have that was perfectly effective can be, especially in the digital space, upended tomorrow, literally overnight. And so no regulation is not the solution. The solution is to, of course, regulate well. And that is what we're talking about here. It's just difficult to do. I think it's harder in the digital space because of the speed, the complexity, the knowledge that it takes. And, and from our perspective, looking at this for quite a while now, the, 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 it's not just the specifics of the case at hand, but those consequences that flow on from that. So I, I, this is hard. This is very hard um, to get right. And I'm less fussed about regulatory capture and much more worried about not enough information, not enough stakeholder engagement, not enough knowledge of the topic, um, but a need to do sort of a, need, a potential for a knee jerk reaction, especially by regulators to do something. And the something ultimately creates bigger challenges in the end if you don't crucially think about like, what is the consumer welfare principle at the outset? How can I, is this a harm that is being caused to consumers that requires this kind of intervention? Or is there some other kind of regulation that's necessary? Or should I just do nothing and see what happens? Because sometimes doing nothing maybe is the best policy because as we all are aware, the speed of change in the digital space is high enough that, as Hosek has clearly indicated, you know, it, there is nobody who's dominant for very long. I mean, we think we know platforms, but there are platforms on top of platforms, and many of them are actually quite dominant in the marketplace, and no one much cares because they're dominant in a marketplace that is not necessarily consumer facing. So you're not familiar with it, but business platforms can be very dominant in their space. And there may be no consequences to that dominance 
because it's facilitating trade between business to business partners, for example, in some niche area. Um, and so again, we have to be very careful when we think about how we wanna regulate this to make sure that we are not destroying the, the opportunities that come with doing more trade in the digital space. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Hosuk, you mentioned a few times, do you want to uh, add anything to what Debbie said? I will just very briefly add that the notion that that were perhaps suggested that platforms are not regulated, I would argue that they're over-regulated. Uh, there is this myth about internet being a legal void. It is not. Uh, it has, it follows the laws of everyone else, like anyone else. Uh, if you buy a helmet on Amazon, it follows all other safety regulations that concerns every other health net that you can buy in a brick and mortar store. The question is, do we need to have a special product law for platforms? Or do we want to have a common legal framework that applies online and offline in an equal way? Search marketing advertising should follow all the same principles as other web advertising. E-commerce should follow all other distance sales, obviously. Otherwise, you end up in a legalistic problem that United States end up in a while, that you created so many special laws that became outdated. So it actually gave preferences to certain sector versus others. Third, if we create a special platform law now, we may end up 30 years uh, from now and realize that we can't actually apply competition policy on platforms anymore because we created the special law that is impossible to get rid of. Uh, on your question about regulatory capture, I would like to address something that I have clearly seen in Europe, but also in other places that the, the new, well, emergence of platforms have basically threatened industries like telecoms that used to be monopolies or are still monopolies or major retailers, media conglomerates who are perhaps not as dominant in the economy, but they're politically extremely powerful. So by challenging uh, these dominant monopolists, you have actually faced a counter accusation of platforms being a monopoly, which is kind of ironic in a way. And if, especially if I look at some of the European countries, uh, the companies in media and retail are also the biggest political donors uh, to the, the leading incumbent parties. We can't, we can't shy away from this fact. So uh, one real perhaps um, exception from this regulatory capture is United States. Retailer, telecoms never really played a major role in US politics in the same way it does in Europe and or in, in Asia. So you can see a clear difference in uh, approach, regulatory approaches towards platforms and in the internet. There are also other factors that makes the United States different, which I wrote about maybe 10 years ago that platforms advertise quite a lot in the United States. So they are not just your enemy, if you're a media company in the United States, they are also your best customers that has created some level of, uh, let's say, ceasefire between the, uh, the new media and the old media, which we haven't seen actually in Europe, because when they established themselves in the, in the European market, they have not necessarily relied on marketing to gain a market share. So there's a clear difference there in terms of regulatory capture. Thanks, thanks, Hosuk. Um, uh, Dionysus, uh, you are often, uh, you, well, I shouldn't say you in person, but, uh, you know, the private sector is often the one accused of the one doing the capturing. So would you have any views on this? Uh, yes. Um, and, and my view is that we need to start with quite some sympathy to policymakers. Their job is not easy. Uh, and uh, I fully agree with uh, Debbie saying that some of them don't have the expertise. Uh, even the tech sector doesn't have all the expertise necessary 
at all you know levels and um, uh, across the company as as the across the companies as they get involved into this policy making process and um, uh, we are talking about new business models we are talking about new technologies which develop very fast and they disrupt uh, either existing uh, um, services and products uh, products that exist for a while or uh, some of them which were actually created just recently um, who remembers MySpace? Uh, I don't want to show my age already, but who remembers MySpace? Who remembers, you know, some of the uh, search engine, Excites and others? Um, they were actually disrupting uh, probably yellow pages back then. They were creating the new revolution called the internet. And they had a very honored uh, decline to say the least because others came into the game and they brought more benefits to consumers and they brought more value to the market. So because of that pace and because of that dynamism, I think it's very difficult for regulators, not just to catch up, but even to regulate the status quo. There is no status quo in the digital space. What do we see today change tomorrow? You know, 16% of Google searches are new every day, 16%. So, uh, who can predict the future? I think it's, it's impossible. And that's why I believe we need to encourage ourselves to work together and help everybody can bring a different expertise. You talked about the industry, you know, the tech sector, we can definitely bring some so our expertise. Um, but there are also, you know, NGOs, there are the academias of this world who can help us get there and get there in a mindset of, of, of assessing the risk. So earlier I was talking about three key principles that uh, would encourage policymakers to consider. And those are, the first one is all about defining the end goal. What is the issue we're trying to solve here? Hosuk talked about um, the abuse of dominance. Is there an issue of abusing? What is the issue we're trying to, to, to uh, solve? And uh, what are the expected outcomes, assuming that we introduce a new piece of legislation? The second principle is to clarify the effectiveness of existing tools. Probably, and we see that in some markets already, there are tools in place which can help us address issues. Building more tools on top increases the complexity, sometimes creates overlap with tools in other areas related to privacy or copyright protection. So introducing new policies needs to be very careful to make sure that we don't reinvent the wheel, we don't add another step in the process. And the third one is to assess the impact in order to minimize the unintentional consequences. What are the benefits of introducing this law for the consumer, for the ecosystems, but what are the potential implications? And I don't think that any of us in this world, either the private sector, the private, the public sector, or anybody else has the you know the answer it isn't the answer will come from a multi-stakeholder discussion and this is exactly what i believe will get us there in a dynamic ongoing discussion to address issues real issues as they come thank you thank you very much Genesis. Um, we have uh, a few questions now that are related to the uh, regulation of cross-border data flows uh, I think Debbie is actually trying to answer some of them uh, online, but for the benefit of all our audience, um, let me pose them and see uh, who wants to jump in here. So uh, uh, the question uh, from Nonato Sulibet is, you know, how are ASEAN countries regulating cross-border data flows and are there any uh, data protection legislation at all uh, in place uh, to do so? Um, Anyone want to jump in on that? I'll just I'll just mention briefly. Yes, uh, there is increasing discussions about cross border data flows in ASEAN, and ASEAN has an e-commerce agreement that is now live. In there, they have done a fair amount of work around how do we handle cross border data flows, including having sample contractual clauses that you could put between two companies across the border um, to help. 
clarify the rules around cross-border data flow between companies. And there's also many of the ASEAN markets are increasingly applying APEX CBPR rules, and they have in place uh, uh, data protection authorities who are helping companies prepare for certification under that process. It's a bit long and a bit complicated, but the point is increasingly in ASEAN, there are both ASEAN's own internal rules around movement of data across borders, but also part of the larger APEC group with 21 economies across the region. Not all of ASEAN is part of APEC, but many of them are increasingly focused on developing rules that are APEC friendly in that space. So I guess the, the short answer is, we are slowly moving towards having ASEAN rules on cross-border data flows that may or may not be consistent with data protection authorities that do similar kinds of things, but capacity across ASEAN in all things varies. And so you would not be surprised to, to know that this also applies to data flows and data protection, uh, that the, we have competence that just varies because the capacity is different. Right, thank you, thank you, David. Yeah. If I may add something, um, sure. uh, maybe Please. with Debbie, I just want to go back to the principles. Like a key, I think a key principle when we look at this kind of uh, of laws is to make sure that we don't create more obstacles for companies to leverage data across borders and innovate uh, in uh, in the process of trying to you know protect consumers or protect those data. Um, and that's, I think, a key um, key characteristic of what a good policy uh, would look like. Uh, Jose, I would like to just jump yeah. in and warn that do not conflate competition policy with privacy. The size of a company and the, the alleged market behavior of the company has nothing to do with, well, uh, my personal information and how it is stored and how it is processed and my privacy right. A small, large, left-handed, right-handed company can <laughs> commit as much uh, privacy breaches as anyone else. So if you mix policy issues and put them in a big pot and say, I have a problem and the problem is called platforms, you are basically trying to not to solve a problem, but you're trying to create a problem that doesn't exist by agglomerating as many problems as you can. So that is not going to help uh, consumers or users. Uh, but I would add that some of the platform measures and remedies that has been proposed could have significantly negative privacy impact. So for example, I mentioned the, the requirement to do interoperability. Uh, so if you have a messaging service that is dominant, for example, in the European Union, they are required to be interoperable. Maybe I don't want to be interoperable as a user with a very small platform that, let's say, comes from Russia. That's, that's my legitimate point. I gave my data to be, uh, to be workable with, uh, let's say, a messaging service that is prevalent in my region. Maybe I do not want to be connected with a messaging app that is legally available, but there might be a reason I didn't subscribe for it. So if you're interoperable, some of my personal information, whether I want it or not, is going to be passed on. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that some platforms have now been required to pass on the business information data regarding its user to its competitors. And uh, that could be benevolent, uh, but that could also be misused. So not all form of, uh, let's say, antitrust is privacy friendly. Right, thank you. Thank you, Hosuk. Um, I'm looking at my clock here on my computer and it's 5.03 Singapore time. So we've gone minutes over time, but I think we have uh, covered a lot of area, uh, a lot of issues today. Uh, I won't try and summarize them, uh, not only because there's no time for it, but it's too complicated. But I hope that um, uh, you will all be encouraged to uh, read uh, the paper that um, uh, Debbie and her team have produced. Uh, please uh, look for it uh, on the Heinrich Foundation website, which is www.heinrichfoundation.com. Uh, 
And um, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the session, the recording of this webinar will be available next week on that website as well. So please uh, have a look at that if you want to you know, get back to some of the points raised here. We've covered a lot of complicated issues. But uh, with that, uh, let me close this webinar by thanking all our three speakers today for their very insightful contributions and uh, wish all of you a wonderful day and evening ahead. And thank you for your attention. And we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you very much.